Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 1st, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the recent Senate finance hearings are revealing a lot about where members think the state's fiscal situation is headed. Second, the ADN editorial page entirely ignores the fundamental problem driving some to push for excess permanent fund draws. Third, some clarifications during the week have reduced concerns about the near-term impact on Alaska of the Biden administration's recent orders on federal lands. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, you've got the weekly top three. Uh, tell me where you where, what you want to do, what you want to start with. Well, let's start with uh, Senate Finance, and, and and we'll incorporate your uh, your um, com- conversation about uh, about Bert uh, Senator Sedman as uh, as as we work through that. Senate Finance has with, with with nothing going on in the House. Senate Finance has sort of been the the center of activity. Uh, in the legislature uh, so far uh, this session, they've held four hearings. Uh, if uh, if people are interested, uh, you can go back and listen to the hearings. If you want the shortcut, there are slide packs uh, for each day of hearings, which uh, which you can work through fairly rapidly and and get a feel for uh, for what's going on. The four four hearings have been uh, the the first day was on production levels, uh, oil production levels. Uh, and where we're headed on that. The second was from Department of Revenue uh, about the, what the uh, revenue outlook is. And the third was from OMB, the administration's OMB, about uh, what's in their uh, proposed FY22 budget and, and their 10-year plan. Uh, and, the, and the last presentation yesterday was from uh, legislative finance, uh, the new legislative finance that sort of looked, took a uh, – um, a more impartial look, if you will, at the uh, at the at the budget, um, and each of those uh, presentations have been uh, have have contained important information. Uh, production, uh, the Department of Natural Resources uh, outlook on production uh, is basically that we can hold production flat, uh, which is which is a good thing, uh, given that the existing fields are. Uh, in natural decline uh, over time, uh, their uh, their outlook with respect to uh, uh, new fields coming on from ConocoPhillips uh, in NPRA and the uh, potential for the uh, the Pika field from Oil Search uh, in Repsol uh, offset those declines. Uh, there's a potential for additional volumes, some volume growth uh, if they come on stronger, but. Uh, Waiting, risk waiting the, uh, the 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 prospects out there. Uh, 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 DNR basically uh, DNR's presentation basically was that we can hold production levels flat, which is which is, which is a plus. I mean, it, as opposed to as opposed to continued decline right. over the next decade. Right. Revenues outlook uh, was primarily focused on two things: oil prices um, and uh, and and where the the permanent fund, the earnings from the permanent fund. Those are our two big revenue drivers. Uh, out there, and um, uh, basically their view was that oil prices uh, uh, aren't going to, the, the oil price cavalry isn't coming over the hill, we aren't going to go to $100, which is what it would take to balance the budget off of traditional revenues, current spending levels off of traditional levels. Uh, we're going to stay uh, well short of that, well short of $100. Uh, 
um, and that uh, uh, you can count on the permanent fund earnings to to produce a steady state five percent, uh, but uh, but but shouldn't be looking for anything uh, uh, more than that. Uh, certainly under current statutes, um, and so that was. I mean, that's a sobering uh, uh, outlook from revenue. OMB uh, was where where uh, uh, the the committee got into uh, a discussion of the spending items that uh, that you're talking about. Uh, this is sort of the bl it's sort of the blind leading the blind. Um, the governor has proposed uh, the 400 million dollars in spending cuts uh, at a at a sort of a a top line level, but he hasn't he hasn't filled out the detail of where those would come from. And I think it, in part what 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 Senator Stedman was responding to. Uh, and, and what you were picking up on in the first segment is is a frustration level of of uh, <laughs> of you, you say four hundred million dollars in cuts, but where are they supposed to come from? Um, back to OMB and OMB is sort of well, we'll we'll find them as we go right. along. And, right. And, and, and Stedman's response is well, <laughs> we haven't found them yet. Uh, and uh, and if we were going to find them, you would think we would have found them so far. Um, and so it's it's. And, and the governor doesn't really propose them this year. It's sort of this ethereal, we'll get to them uh, in future years. It's, it's a lot like the Senate was when uh, Governor Dunleavy was still in the Senate, uh, and they said, no, we're not going to cut. We're, we're going to make some cuts this year. It was sort of moving money around. But we're really going to cut next year. And next year never came. And I and I think uh, I think what you're seeing from Senator Sedman is is a bit of frustration. Not only not only is he reflecting what what I think the what he thinks is the political will in the building, which is a lack of desire to make these cuts, but but uh, on top of that, a frustration with the administration about not 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 even the, the administration identifying where these cuts would come from. And then the final presentation by Legislative Finance uh, yesterday. Uh, was eye-opening in in two senses. One was uh, they uh, sort of went through the cuts, uh, the purported cuts that the administration had made uh, in the FY22 budget, and and identified that most of these cuts were one time was one time money that essentially you were using to fund certain certain spending items uh, from either COVID or in the case of oil and gas tax credits from ADA funds, uh, funds that you wouldn't normally pull in or you wouldn't normally see on a recurring basis uh, uh, to, to, to fund spending. And so rather than funding them, funding these spending items from UGF, they were funding them from these other sources and, and calling them cuts because, because you weren't funding them from UGF. It looked like UGF spending was down when, in fact, the spending levels were the same. They were just being funded from other sources and ledge finance. Uh, uh, did a good job, I think, walking through uh, the purported cuts that were out there and, and identifying them and, and coming to the conclusion that basically uh, the administration's proposed FY22 uh, budget is flat. The second thing that Ledge Finance did uh, in yesterday's presentation, which I thought was important, uh, is, is sort of a repeat of what they'd done in a, in a prior presentation uh, earlier, before the session got started, uh, before the old House Finance Committee, uh, and 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 it was to point out that look, uh, the the governor's proposed use of, of an excess uh, permanent fund draw, an, an excess draw from permanent fund earnings uh, this year and next, which the which the governor has proposed, uh, is, is not costless. It comes at the cost of about 160 million dollars. Uh, uh, annually, uh, in less revenue, because you, because you're lowering the investment base, you're pulling money out of the earnings reserve, out of the permanent fund, lowering the investment base. Uh, you're you're the, there's going to be less investment to produce le that, that would produce less earnings in future years. That's about 160 million dollars a year in perpetuity, um, and and that I think um, uh, was and it is an important point uh, as well. The other thing that these hearings have done that um, that you don't pick up from just looking at the slide decks is sort of the colloquy that's going on, the discussion that's going on at the table, particularly between Senator Stedman and Senator Hoffman. Um, and it's about, they're, they're, they're basically sort of identifying issues that they're going to come back to 
during the course of the session in the in the development of the budget um, and flesh out further. And and these are these are very interesting uh, discussions. Uh, one in particular that they had a couple of days ago was about all taxes. Uh, I guess it was during the presentation on production levels. And Senator Stedman uh, said, uh, this doesn't look, this, this flat production doesn't look any different than what we were looking at um, in, the early two, in the early 20 teens uh, when we were doing SB21. And SB21, I mean, this is, this is Bert talking, SB21 was sort of given us as a promise uh, that that we would increase production levels if we if we lowered taxes we would increase production levels right. going out in the future, um, and um, uh, and and Burton Hoffman had this conversation and said well that didn't occur, and so it, at the end of that conversation was basically we're going to come back and look at SB twenty one, so it's there there are a lot of issues that are coming up in these discussions that I think are important. Well, and I would agree. Uh, several people in the chat room have brought up the fact that, hey, even when the governor did have, uh, uh, did have, uh, uh, you know, cuts that, and had details on where his cuts were coming from, he got just totally ripped to shreds. And I think again, that goes back to the political will question. Even, I mean, his this this budget definitely more amorphous than his 2018 budget, which immediately got him. I mean, still the the ADN is still using words like draconian uh, in some of these things. Uh, and and yet still, uh, you know, he's getting, you know, people are getting lambasted for it. So, I mean, I think the bottom line is, is that we could see that there is still no will to to make these cuts. There's no discussion. I mean, they talk about the sacrifices of Alaskans. They talk about, you know, all this other kind of stuff. But where's the sacrifice in government? There is no sacrifice. It's always in the private sector. The private sector and the citizens have to bear the entire brunt of it. The legislature, the the government, the the, the public sector never has to take any of it. If anything is cut back, it immediately is a gasp moment for them that that just possibly couldn't happen anymore. Yeah, Michael, the, 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 the challenge here is we just had an election, right? I mean, if to, to get to 21 and 11 that are going to make these cuts, or even, or even the governor plus 16, to get to, to, to get to 21 plus 11, you're going to have to have legislators who are willing to make it, who believe they have mandates from their districts uh, uh, to make these cuts. And, and if anything... This last election cycle, we, we've had this discussion before, but the, some of the some of the red districts turned even redder. I mean, right. John Coghill got de- got defeated, and and, uh, uh, and 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 his replacement is more conservative. Kathy Geisel got defeated; her replacement's more conservative. Uh, but but overall, if anything, the legislature became more purple. Um, and you've got Republicans. Sarah Rasmussen is, is one I, 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 I use often. But you've got Republicans who say, "Yeah, I want to cut, but I can't cut these things because my district, my district wants to uh, wants to preserve them." Well, by the time you take sixty legislators, and each of them have got things that their that their district wants to preserve, you don't get cuts. Um, and so it's not I, I it's not that it's not for lack of creativity. In terms of where you can make cuts, the, the governor's 2018 budget or 2019 budget um, uh, showed that there were places where uh, where you can where theoretically you can make deep cuts. It's not for lack of creativity in, in identifying those cuts. It's for lack of political will. And 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 you know if we were ever going to have a focus on bringing legislators down there or electing legislators who would make these cuts. The last election cycle should have been it, and we ended up turning more purple uh, uh, in the legislature. So it's I, yes, uh, there's a huge desire to make cuts uh, on on the part of some people. Yes, there's 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 ways that you can identify. I mean, the university is still overfunded compared to its lower 48 peers, significantly overfunded compared to its lower, lower 48 peers. You can identify all sorts of areas to make them, but you have to have the political will to do it. You have to have 21 and, and 11 to do it. And I, Bert, you know, as, as much as we want to, as, as much as we want to attack him, Bert's reflecting the, the, the building in the sense of there is not the political will to make those cuts. So what Brad's saying here, I think, is basically it's not just the politicians, it's the people who elected them, that these are constituencies that obviously like the high levels of government spending and are okay with taxes or whatever, 
Uh, again, my problem, uh, my problem with this whole thing is that, uh, you know, we brought the ideas forward. We've looked at the, you know, we've looked at the cuts. We've done what can be done. And any idea of giving them more money at this point just basically screams that they're going to do what they've always done, which is spend, overspend, spend and spend some more. And uh, and that's that's my big problem with moving forward on the talking of taxation and everything else is, you know, past performance is indicative of future results, Brad. And all they're going to do is take every dollar that we give them and they're going to spend that and then try and spend some more and we'll still be in the hole. That's just that's where I'm at. Well, Michael, the problem, the, the challenge with that is they're spending it out of the PFD and by cutting the PFD. I mean, they, we do have taxes. Uh, the, the PFD cuts are taxes. And, and they will continue to do that. Um, if, we don't have, if we don't have alternatives, if we don't have substitutes for the revenues, they'll take it out of PFDs. And the top 20, as we've talked on the show before, the top 20 percent are just fine with that. Uh, as, as, I've, as I've said on the show before, there's this unholy alliance between people like Natasha uh, and others in the top 20 percent who are who are who, who who are not serious about sp- cutting spending because they don't have to pay for it. it the, the the costs are shoved off on middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, through PFD cuts. So um, y- y- the, the the challenge is they will continue to spend and they will continue to fund it uh, through PFD cuts. If we don't come up with substitutes that spread the burden more fairly, more equitably among all Alaska families, particularly among the top 20 percent, they'll just continue to, to, to use PFD cuts. You can already see it. I mean, one of the, one of the colloquies that happened during the Finance Committee uh, meeting was Natasha started pounding on the table at one point uh, because, because the, the OMB had not included PFDs as part of spending uh, she wanted them included as part of spending because if you if you treat them as spending, uh, they show up to be a huge a huge segment uh, of the budget. And she wanted to include them as, as spending because she wanted to make the point that that if we didn't have a PFD, the budget would be in balance. We wouldn't have to worry about cuts. The budget the budget would be in balance, and and you, you know, that's her attitude because the PFD is meaningless to her. And it's meaningless to her and, and, and her donor class. So we will continue to, there will continue to be taxes. There will conti- if we don't have a substitute, there will continue to be taxes. There will continue to be revenues. Legislators will be, uh, uh, legislators along the lines of Natasha and others will be perfectly happy with that outcome. The budget will be in balance. We just won't have a PFD. We will have wiped it. We will have used, we will have balanced the budget on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and, and that's, that's where we're headed. So when I talk about taxes, I'm talking about them as a substitute, not as more, but as a substitute to PFD cuts, a more equitable uh, 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 source of revenues, more equitable in the sense that it's spread better across Alaska families, a more equitable sense, uh, uh, set of revenues uh, than, what we're using, uh, than what we're using with PFD cuts. And you can couple that. Uh, with uh, with the governor's constitutional amendment or with other constitutional amendments that would constitutionalize the PFD, take that take that off the table uh, to ensure that they don't have PFD cuts plus uh, plus uh, revenues that the that the revenues that the, the revenues from replacement revenues are are truly replacements. But uh, it, it's naive, truly, it's naive to say we're not going to have taxes. We do have taxes with PFD cuts. We will continue to have taxes of some sort. The question is, uh, uh, the question is the is is the equity of of the types of taxes we have. Well, I mean, it's again, it's naive to say we don't have taxes in that twenty five percent of our own royalty, oil royalty, is already goes directly to the state. We already have the largest stealth tax in the in the history of the nation. It's already going to the state government. We're spending more than any other state on a per capita basis. I mean, it's all there. Um, so you're right. I mean, we are spending it. Uh, I, you know, now to, to address one of Harold's comments, look, we're not vilifying the top 20 percent. They're not evil. They're just people who are looking out for their own interests and they're not, uh, you know, they're not feeling the pinch. And so they're they're OK to let the to let the table run as they go forward. That's the thing. They, they're fine with that until they start to feel the pinch. Nothing changes, is your point. No, exactly right. And you can see it with Natasha. I mean, this this table pounding exercise that she went through was all about 
uh, was all about uh, uh, putting the PFD, including the PFD revenues, as part of government revenues. And then, you know, the table pounding was, and then we balanced the budget. What we have, she said, is not is not a, a budget crisis. We have a priority crisis. We're spending it. We have the money. We have the money to, to fund the government that we've got currently. We're just spending it in the wrong place, is what she's arguing, that, is what right, she's arguing right. in terms of PFD cuts. Right. So we're on to the second of our weekly top three. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about the governor's plan, which was referenced in the last thing, and how the ADN continues to uh, – bang this drum brad has got some issues with some of the things that they talked about in this piece uh brad go ahead and uh give us your thoughts so this is a adn editorial that was published um, over the weekend the title of it is governor dunleavy's 6.3 billion dollar uh permanent fund grab and that, that headline refers to both the 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 draw the the normal draw the statutory draw from the permanent fund as well as the excess take uh, from the permanent fund. That's how you get to $6.3 billion. So I think they over-dramatize they over -dramatize the governor's proposal uh, from the outset with that headline. But, but here, here's my problem with, with the ADN. The, 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 there are two permanent fund issues. One is intergenerational, an issue between generations, um, and that is, that, that's, that's the excess PFD draw, the excess permanent fund draw. If you take more money out of the permanent fund now, uh, you're reducing the investment base and you are uh, reducing the amount of earnings available to future generations. Essentially, excess takes out of the permanent fund are a tax on future generations. Uh, and as I said, legislative finance has quantified uh, the governor's proposal in that regard at about $160 million a year. You're taxing future generations, all future generations, in perpetuity by about $160 million a year, uh, uh, reducing their revenue by about $160 million a year uh, through the excess uh, permanent fund draw. That's, that's one issue, the intergenerational issue. There's a second permanent fund issue, the intragenerational issue, and that is are you treating Alaskans fairly, uh, Alaskans in the current generation fairly, with, with how you're dealing with, uh, with the permanent fund. The permanent fund dividend, as Governor Hammond envisioned it, was – to give a portion of the revenues uh, to all current Alaskans, all, all, all Alaskans in, in each generation uh, in the form of a dividend to, to share that wealth uh, 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 in, 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 terms of, in terms of permanent fund dividends uh, with, uh, with members of the current generation. Um, Senator Von Imhoff at the other extreme uh, wants to uh, take all that permanent fund dividend away and use it to fund government, uh, essentially treat it as government revenue, um, and uh, and 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 insulate her uh, and others in the top 20% from having any cost responsibility for current government costs, because permanent fund dividend, the the elimination of the permanent fund dividend wouldn't affect her much. The much most of the burden falls on middle uh, and lower income Alaska families. Those are the two issues: the intergenerational. Are you treating future future generations fairly? And the intragenerational, are you treating all current uh, Alaska families fairly? The ADN editorial focuses entirely on the first issue, on the intergenerational issue, um, and says, you know, current Alaskans shouldn't be stealing from future Alaskans. Current Alaskans should fix their own uh, problem uh, and leave future Alaskans alone. Uh, and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be making these excess uh, permanent fund draws. And they cite Governor Hammond, and they cite all sorts of things uh, uh, for that proposition. They entirely ignore uh, the second issue, the intragenerational issue, and treating all current, all current Alaskans uh, equitably and fairly in how you're, in how you're, uh, how you're using uh, uh, permanent fund uh, earnings. Entirely ignore it. And, and, and the problem I have is I think that second issue is 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 a big contributor to the first issue. You don't solve the first issue, the intergenerational issue, until you solve the second issue, the intragenerational uh, issue. And the reason for that is this: a lot of a lot of the push to 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 have an excess permanent fund draw uh, now is to pay a permanent fund dividend uh, to current Alaskans who feel they have been cheated uh, by not getting the permanent fund dividend that current that current law provides. Right. Uh, if we had paid them, if we had treated current Alaskans fairly and paid them 
uh, the, the permanent fund dividend that they're entitled to, there wouldn't be this big push to take money out of the future. And the ADN entirely ignores the relationship between those two issues uh, in the editorial, and I think is missing uh, a, a big part of the permanent fund picture uh, by uh, by ignoring that relationship between the two. Well, and again, they use they in fact use the word draconian in this article uh, as well, talking about the governor's cuts. The only time that they talk about the size and scope of government in this entire piece is the one time that they talk about it, and they talk about draconian cuts. The thing that leaped out at me is they talk about uh, Hammond's plan and the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend and everything else. And he said, and then they say, the plan worked almost as designed, but growing state budgets outpaced the growth of the permanent fund. And and that to me, the growing state budgets outpaced the growth. That is all a function of the legislature. Now, maybe, as you argued earlier, maybe it's what their constituents wanted, maybe not. Maybe the constituents just weren't paying attention, which they make the argument in this article that the constituents weren't paying attention, as Hammond envisioned. They didn't really care to think about the intricacies of, of state budgets or, or oil things or anything else while being engaged in the permanent fund dividend. But the growing state budgets outpaced the growth of the permanent fund. That is the money quote, of, to me, of this whole article. We have lived beyond our means, and we're going to continue to live beyond our means because nobody has the political guts to say we can't keep doing it. Well, we haven't. Yes, we haven't elected people that have the guts to do that. I mean, we, we've got sixty legislative districts, forty House districts, twenty Senate districts. They're elected by people in uh, each of the legislators are elected by people in their districts. We haven't elected people, a majority of people, twenty-one plus eleven. Uh, in in those elections that uh, that are gonna that are gonna make those cuts and you, you you've got to do that in order in order for those cuts to occur and you know going back to Sarah Rasmussen again her argument is people in her district don't want to make those cuts uh, so you've got Republicans out there you got you got some Republicans who are saying let's cut away let's you know let's let's get the university down let's get Medi- Medicaid down let's get uh, uh, K through 12 spending down. You got you got Republicans who want to do that, but you've got others uh, who who you know for various reasons say we can't cut this, we can't cut that, we can't cut the other thing. And by the time you go through 60 legislators, that adds up to to, to minimal if uh, if any cuts. It's not yes, the legislators are the problem, but they've been elected by their districts and they have they have whether right or wrong, they have a sense of what their districts want. And we don't have 21 plus 11 districts uh, in the state that are saying they're electing legislators that say uh, uh, to, to cut spending to the levels uh, it would take to get it down to traditional revenues. But this ADN article obviously misses the point of both uh, both that part that I just uh, you and I just made and the point obviously that if Alaskans had been paid now here's the the flip side of that if Alaskans had been paid their full dividend we would have looked at this crisis a little bit sooner we maybe at 2018 2017 we would have had to look at it and go wait we we can't keep doing what we're doing this is all this has done is just kick the can down the road uh, and again created more of these problems. You want to give us just a sneak peek of three, and then we'll take it in the break at the top, I guess. Yep. So the three is uh, uh, we now know more about uh, the effect of President Biden's uh, uh, decisions on federal lands uh, last week. Uh, And actually, uh, they've improved the picture from the standpoint uh, of Alaska. The uh, last week, uh, there was there was uncertainty about what uh, what the president's decisions meant with respect to uh, future permits on existing leases. Uh, the clarification that that has occurred has occurred since uh, is that the administra- is that the administration can, it, it intends to continue to process permits on existing leases um, and not shut down activity on existing leases because of of lack of permits. That's that's good for Alaska. As we talked last week, the, the most important place that uh, uh, President Biden's uh, uh, decision affects is ANWR, or not ANWR, I'm sorry, NPRA. Um, and N- NPRA, we've got existing leases. Conoco's got existing leases out there in, in, in areas they want to develop. The key question is where they're going to be able to get the permits to develop those areas. Um, and the clarification that's come since in the last week has been yes, uh, they will be able to get those permits. So there's still... And we can talk about this when we after the break. There's still uh, 
adverse impacts from the president's decision, but it's not quite as bad uh, as uh, as some uh, some thought it might be at first blush. I'll let you uh, stretch that out there and and expand that for us on uh, on the uh, the Biden. Uh, the Biden executive orders and the legacy that he is going to try and implement here over the next four years on the state of Alaska. Yeah. So Anwar, I mean, there's two areas that people are worried about, Anwar and MPRA. Uh, Anwar economically is off the table. I mean, it, it, you're not going to find, as we saw with the with the lease sale, you're not going to find private investors willing to come in and invest in Anwar. The, the future of the oil industry is too uncertain. The costs, <coughs> excuse me, the costs, of, of going in and developing, uh, finding and developing leases, uh, or finding and developing oil in Anwar uh, is too risky. There are a number of other areas uh, that are m- much less risky, much more solid in terms of oil plays. I mean, all we have to do is look at Conoco's uh, uh, acquisition of Concho Resources down in the Permian Basin, uh, sort of reorient- reorienting their company, Conoco, uh, to being a, uh, a, at least a a very large player uh, in the Permian Basin, if not in a, if not a Permian Basin focused company, uh, there's just too many other places to to invest uh, to 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 look at Anwar. So yes, Biden is shutting down Anwar, but Anwar, uh, as we've talked about on the show before, Anwar wasn't going to be a player uh, in any event because of because of economics and and the uncertainty in the oil industry. The big place that 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 the Biden rules affect from Alaska's standpoint is NPRA um, and and Conoco's developments in NPRA. And there were two there are two issues uh, uh, with respect to that. One, does Conoco have the leases it needs to make its development? And the answer is yes. The much more important issue was can Conoco get get the permits it needs to develop those leases? And when Biden's uh, announcement originally came out. Uh, there was uncertainty about. I mean, the, they said that the that the the permits that Conoco had in hand, or the permits that that lessees had in hand, uh, the federal government would uh, observe those. But could you get additional permits? The question of whether you could get additional permits was up in the air. And at this point, the guidance has come out of uh, out of the Biden administration is they are going to continue to give permits, new permits, uh, on existing leases. So that's that's good news. It means. It means Conoco can continue develop, to develop with some certainty, continue to invest with some certainty uh, on the on the leases that it's got in NPRA, and that's very important. If you look at the if you look at the production profile that uh, DNR presented to uh, to Senate Finance uh, last week, that production profile uh, depends on or or is 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 tied to. Uh, the development of MPRA and additional vol- volumes, volumes coming out of MPRA. The area where we do get hurt is on new leases. When you're developing uh, oil resources, sometimes you find new plays, new trends, new ideas. Geologists look at uh, and engineers look at, th- at seismic and say, oh, I think there's oil over here that we really haven't identified before. I've seen something in another lease that now leads me to believe that there's that there's opportunities in new leases, that's that that is off the table uh, uh, with the Biden administration and the announcement they're not going to issue any additional uh, any new leases. Uh, the identification of of new trends, new opportunities, new extensions of existing fields or existing plays uh, that we that we you know know about now and that we now you know, that at some point we think may bleed over into other areas. That is off the table, and that really that sort of cuts off additional development opportunities in the in the future. But there's so much uncertainty in the oil industry right now about what the future holds. In any event, while that's a problem, uh, it's not a huge problem right now. You know, ask me right. again in five years, right. it may become a huge problem. So, like best case scenario, what we could best case hope for at this point is to hold the level of production steady. That's best case uh, because we're not going to expand it because no new leases, no new anything else. We're going to do, you know, we're going to we're going to be struggling just to hold the current amount, current flow at current rates. Yeah, best case scenario is about what uh, did, for the ten year outlook is is about what uh, DNR presented uh, last week, which is which is steady state production, which is pretty good, you know, given that Prudhoe's in decline, Parks in decline, existing fields are in decline, having uh, having new production that offsets that. 
uh, is is pretty good. Not good enough for Burton and uh, and Senator Hoffman, but but it's pretty good. Right. Uh, and and I guess the point is the Biden announcement doesn't really get in the way of that. Uh, in the ten-year window that uh, that we're looking at. Okay, how about the effects of uh, the Biden administration and what they're doing, and the effects on uh, on uh, you know on oil world oil prices in general? Because it is going to have an effect. I mean, that may be the only silver lining here is we may see an increase in the price of oil, which will help offset some of the state deficit. Uh, where do you think we end up? I mean, are we talking about oil in the seventy-five, eighty, eighty-five, ninety dollar range, or what? I'm not sure we're talking about oil that high, but but the current consensus is that oil prices are going to go up uh, because people aren't investing in in new oil prospects because of the uncertainty with where not only the Biden administration but the world generally, Europe uh, and, uh, and and other places are going with respect to uh, with respect to climate change regulations and climate change uh, uh, focus, um, and so. A, a decreasing, a, a decreasing investment in oil uh, as uh, as we continue through the next few years may mean uh, higher oil prices uh, in the near term. Um, some uh, some argue that that's that sort of creates oil's own death spiral because at higher prices, you, the economics of of renewable energy becomes even better, and there's more investment in renewable energy, and it phases oil out sooner. Uh, but there is there is some uh, 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 consensus on the fact that oil prices are uh, increasing in a world where uh, oil investment is declining. Brad Keithley, uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, what should people be looking out for here quickly, Brad, about 40 seconds? Well, House organization, is the House ever going to get organized? And if it does, how is it going to organize uh, and second, uh, what they should be following is Senate finance, because Senate finance, because the Senate got organized early, Senate finance is going to be, uh, it looks like it's taking the lead on the budget and on revenue measures and on everything else. So uh, keeping track of what's going on in Senate finance, if you, if you want to know what's going on in the legislature, uh, I think it's going to be the key. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming in and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.